Uh, today we're going to talk about rules 15 and 16, which is basically the free relief rules um, going on in, uh, with the new rules. And 15 is going to be relief from loose impediments and stuff like that, so it's going to be the rule where you're going to move stuff away from your ball. And 16 is the rule where you're going to move your ball away from stuff. So we're going to kind of talk about these in depth here today. Rule 15 is covered in these three little points here, loose impediments, movable obstructions, and your ball or ball marker helping or interfering with play. So kind of a little combination of old rules here. Rule 22 is kind of is the ball interfering with play, and it's just kind of been put into this new rule here. All right, some notable changes for Rule 15. Loose impediments may be removed from bunkers and penalty areas, so basically anywhere in the golf course we can remove loose impediments. However, the player is still on the hook if the ball moves in this situation. Okay, with the exception of two places. What two places can the ball move with no penalty? Putting green, teeing area. Putting green and teeing area, yep. Okay, player will drop a ball into a relief area when taking relief for a ball in or on a movable obstruction. So we talked about the dropping procedures and the placing procedures last week in rule 14. Uh, so now we've got, instead of when we had a situation where your ball came to rest on a towel, for example, where we would drop it on that spot underneath the towel, and now we actually have a relief area. So every, all the dropping procedures are, are the same. So we're not uh, changing different procedures for dropping within different rules. Again, one of the, the whole things we want with the new rules is uniformity across all situations. Lifting a ball based on it helping another player, which was called assisting, only applies when the ball is on the putting green now. So a ball cannot be helping somebody if it's in the general area, or in a bunker or in a penalty area. It has to be in the putting green. Balls and ball markers are treated equally with respect to helping or interfering, so there's no difference there. And the purpose of this rule is there are movable objects that are not treated as part of the challenge. We don't need these things in our way to be making golf harder. Golf's already as hard as it is anyway, so let's you know, let you get these things out of the way. So these movable obstructions and these loose impediments can be uh, moved out of the way to help us make a better shot. Okay, the player, again, needs to be careful in moving loose impediments near his or her ball off the putting green because there will be a penalty for causing them to, if moving them causes that ball to move. Okay, when we're talking about obstructions, when you move an obstruction, something artificial, you're not going to be penalized for the ball moving. But anything natural, you will be penalized with the exception of the putting green and, of course, the teeing area, which we don't talk about much. Okay, so let's figure out what loose impediments are. There's been a little bit of a change kind of the way in the way they're defined, not a whole lot, but just a couple little things that have been tweaked. Unattached natural objects, so they can't be fixed or growing. So this is going to include stones, loose grass, leaves, branches, sticks, dead animals, and animal waste, things like that. It's kind of funny that it says dead animals instead of animals because an animal has its own definition in the new rules. So a dead animal is a loose impediment. So if you have like a dead moose in your bunker, <laughs> it's a loose impediment. So, okay. A little interesting note here, sand and loose soil are not loose impediments, period. End of statement. This is a change from the old rules. that used to be a loose impediment on the putting green. It's no longer defined as a loose impediment. However, you still get to move them on the putting green. So it doesn't change anything within the rules of golf. It just changed the definition. And I always bring this up. I got it wrong on the test. I'm going to get it right next month, I promise. I'm going to get it right this time. All right. Worms, insects, and similar animals are loose impediments. Not, not a change from before. They can be easily removed. The mounds and the webs that they build, those are all loose impediments. These are not considered loose within the definition of loose impediments. If they're attached or if they're growing, solidly embedded, which means you just can't pick it out very easily. Like an acorn that is pushed into the green a little bit, if you can use a divot tool or tee to get it out, you're okay. Used to be you weren't, but now you're okay as long as it's easily done. But if you have to really dig around it, that's what they're talking about. So. Again, kind of a grayish area there, but we're going to side with the player on this one as well. Sticking to the ball, formerly called adhering to the ball, um, but now anything that is sticking to the ball, so a wet piece of grass sticking to your ball, is not a loose impediment. So if removal of that on the course is going to cause you a penalty for cleaning the ball. Special cases, again, that are not loose impediments, sand, loose soil, dew, frost, or water. Okay? Those are just things that we got to deal with. Okay? We can get rid of them on the putting green, Except for the dew, frost, and water, you don't want to, you're not going to be able to pick all that up on your line and so on and so forth. The teeing area is a special area as well. As we know, we can get rid of all that stuff in the, in the teeing area. Okay, two extra special cases that are players' choices. Snow and natural ice, other than frost, are either a loose impediment or temporary water when it's on the ground. 
So snow falling through the air isn't temporary water until it gets to the ground. So you don't get relief from it as it's falling from the air, I guess, so. But, all right, special cases again, spider webs, they specifically put this in the new rules. Loose impediments, even though they're attached to another object. So this is an exception to the exception to the exception, I do believe, if you think about it that way. But a spider web is a loose impediment, and you're able to go ahead and tear that down. All right, so any questions on what loose impediments are before we move on? Good on that? As you can see, the definition has been kind of just tweaked a little bit. It, it depends on what the sticks are. Okay. It really does. If, if they're part of the tree, then no. 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 In the right 15-1, exception one, mm -hmm. the, that first bullet point is weird. It, it says, like, if there's a loose impediment and it might cause the ball to move, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't say it will cause it to move. Right. So the, the, the first bullet point, um, it's just, again, might is one of those words that is kind of along the lines of should and may in that, in that area. So you're always entitled to remove a loose impediment. You always are. The rules allow you to do that. If your ball is sitting on top of a leaf, you are entitled to move that leaf. If your ball moves, you're penalized. You know, the chances of that leaf not moving are like zero. Moving the ball, I should say, because it's underneath it. You know, so again, even, even if you can slip it out under there, like we talked about, you know, the, the sheet off the table, the ball is still going to do what? It's going to drop a little bit where that leaf was holding it up. So it is going to move. You can move it, but you're going to get penalized for moving the ball. All right. Again, loose impediments may move, be removed anywhere, okay, on or off the course. So if, there's a, if you're standing near and out of bounds and there's some loose impediments that are, you want to move in somebody's yard, go ahead, help yourself. Okay, you can remove them in any way. There's no restrictions on how we do this. Hand, foot, towel, kick it, air blower. I, think I kind of joked about that. If you had a power blower, you can remove it, but please don't bring a power blower on the golf course. Okay, and those are the examples. I put those decisions up there because that's an example of how the decisions are now incorporated into the new rules. Again, we don't have decisions. We don't refer to them, but I like, like to show how we had the decisions that used to actually be used to come up with the ruling. Now they're just incorporated straight into the rule. Two exceptions, of course, no removing loose impediments where the ball must be replaced. Okay, we talked a little bit about this, but I do want to be clear on that. So, for example, if you kick your ball in play and it was on top of a leaf, first of all, what do we have to do with that golf ball? Replace it, right? Okay, we don't get to move that loose impediment out of the way if your ball was on top of that loose impediment because the removal of that loose impediment would cause the ball to move. So this is with an exception here when you don't get to remove a loose impediment if you are replacing a ball on or up against a loose impediment. Okay, kind of a weird way to look at it and to think about it, but it makes perfect sense when, you, when it really hits you. So. Can somebody do that on purpose to gain an advantage and what? take the penalty? Um, like, like, to, like if they had like a bunch of loose impediments on their, around their ball or something and they just said, I'm going to kick my ball and get a one-stroke penalty. I think we're looking at something a little bit more severe than, than, than moving your ball in play in that situation. I think I would be uh, maybe uh, looking at a possible disqualification for a spirit of the game violation under Rule 1. Um, it would be interesting to, to get in that situation, but no, stuff like that never happens, right? No. Okay, good. All right, it also applies when play is stopped, so you don't get to go out there and do all this stuff if we have play stopped for, for weather or whatever the reason is. Does not apply to the putting green. Again, we know that the putting green is a special area, so you can remove all the loose impediments that you want. If the ball moves, fine, no penalty. If you have your ball on a loose impediment on the putting green, you get to move that loose impediment. If the ball moves, fine, replace it, no penalty. So, okay. Other exception is no deliberately removing loose impediments to affect a ball in motion. So if a ball is rolling toward a loose impediment and you pick that loose impediment up, we have a violation. You're not allowed to remove that uh, loose impediment at that point. Ball in motion is everywhere. Ball in motion is everywhere. On the putting green, you're not allowed to do that as well. So once the ball is in motion, don't touch anything. All right, so let's talk about this in depth. Without penalty, a player will remove a loose impediment anywhere on and off the course and may do so in any way. Two exceptions that we just talked about, but I want to make sure that we're really clear on this. Okay? We have an example here before replacing a ball that was lifted from anywhere except the putting green again. A player must not deliberately remove a loose impediment that if when the ball moved was at rest would likely have caused the ball to move. 
So deliberately is underlined. So the situation we talked about kicking your ball in play, if you kick your ball in play and also happen to kick that leaf, you're okay. And you don't have to replace that leaf. But if that leaf stayed in place, you cannot remove that leaf deliberately. Okay? If the player does so, you're going to get one penalty stroke, but the removed loose impediment does not need to be replaced. So in that situation, if you wanted to take the one penalty stroke and not, and, you know, in that situation, that's kind of what you were talking about right there. So, but you know, intentionally kicking stuff and things like that is a completely different rule. Okay, and again, the ball in motion, does everybody remember the Camilo Vajegas situation there? You can see in this uh, picture down there below, he's got, uh, his ball is rolling back toward him. You can see the ball kind of waist high, I'll say, right on the right of him, behind him on the picture there, rolling back toward him and he removed a loose impediment. And so he ended up getting a penalty for this, for removing a loose impediment. All right, so, if a player's removal of a loose impediment causes his or her ball to move, the ball must be replaced on its original spot, and if we're not sure about it, we're going to estimate it. Okay, rule 14.2 covered that. Oops. Okay. All right. Okay. Did everything right. He's got one penalty stroke, but he did everything right. So, replaced it, no big deal there. So... All right, player gets one penalty stroke under 9.4b for making your ball move, and he had to replace it. If he doesn't replace it, what's going to happen? If he makes a stroke, he's got a wrong place penalty, it becomes a two-stroke penalty. Yeah. All right, except when rule 7.4 applies, there's no penalty for a ball move during search that we're talking about, and when another exception to 9.4b, there's all kinds of different exceptions in there. So, again, exceptions to the exceptions, but basically the bottom line that we're talking about this rule is if you cause your ball to move, you got to replace it. Some exceptions would apply that we've already talked about. So, any questions on that? <coughs> All right. Okay. Again, we in that situation. If multiple things happen, I just talked about the the wrong place. Well, 1.3 C4 kicks in. We we'll figure out if there's multiple penalties or just one. All right. Here's the question here. In a stroke play event, Jackie's ball is at rest in the rough, and a leaf is three inches away, but not touching her ball. As she's searching for it, she accidentally kicks her ball. She lifts her ball, cleans it, removes the leaf that was near her ball, and replaces the ball in the correct spot. Which of the following is true? We've got no penalty, one penalty, two, two penalty, three penalty strokes. What do we think? We got, an, we got an A. All right. So she kicks her ball. Is that a penalty? She's searching, so no penalty there. She, she lifts it and cleans it. Is there a penalty? No. She's, this is not one of those four situations that you cannot, you're not allowed to clean the ball. So she can pick it up and clean it, no problem. Okay, again, what are the four situations we can't clean the ball? Identifying, interference, to see if it's cut or cracked, or to see if relief is available. This is not one of those situations, is it? So you, you're allowed to clean your ball in this situation. Okay, so she removes that leaf that's three inches from her ball. Is that a penalty? No. no. It wasn't up against her ball. It wouldn't have caused her ball to move when she would have moved it in the first place, right? Okay, there you go. No penalty. Again, I'm very careful to not penalize Jackie. But, but if there was a question as that leaf may, that leaf may move her ball to the original spot, there would be a penalty. Absolutely. If, that, if, if the leaf would have caused her ball to move. If the leaf doesn't have to be touching the ball. Yeah, it could, it could yeah. I mean, I see what your, your point is. The removal of the leaf, um, if it's three inches away in this situation, I'm, we're probably going to side with Jackie. Yeah. Um, but there would have to be some really weird circumstances to say that would cause it to move. But it's possible, yes. So if we determine that the removal of the leaf would have caused her ball to move, then she's not allowed to, to remove the leaf. No. Everybody good on that one? That's exactly. If the ball was on the leaf, then she can't remove that leaf. She, yeah, she kicked and moved her ball that was on a leaf. She's got to put it back on the leaf. Yep. Yep. All right. Good on loose impediments? Perfect. All right. We should be able to get through pretty quick today and get everybody out on the course for your tea time today. So we're pretty good. All right. 15.2, movable obstructions, relief from a movable obstruction, and relief for a ball not found but in or on a movable obstruction. So that gets kind of an interesting situation there. These rules haven't really changed at all, um, but we're going to go over them in depth to make sure we're good on it. Treatment of movable parts of movable obstructions is changed a little bit, so you can move movable parts in some cases, in some cases you can't. 
I'll go over that here in a little bit of some things that you can and cannot do. <coughs> substitution is permitted during the relief procedure. As we know, any time that you are dropping a ball, you can substitute a golf ball, so no problems there. All right, so this rule covers free relief that is allowed from artificial objects that meet the definition of a movable obstruction. It does not give relief from immovable obstructions. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. So immovable is under Rule 16. We're talking about movable obstructions here. You do not get relief from boundary ob objects or integral objects. No free relief is allowed on that. So what is a boundary object? Fence, OB stake, you know, something that defines what out of bounds is. That's a boundary object. Okay, an integral object, what is that? Something that the committee has declared to be a part of the golf course. For example, stones inside of a penalty area, stacked stones inside of a penalty area, or maybe a, a dirt road. They're saying we want it to be, you play from it, you don't get free relief from a dirt road or something like that. But that's what the committee declares. Okay? Obstruction is any artificial object. So anything that has been made by man or has been turned into it, like we've had some examples in the old rules before, like if you have a couple of logs, they're loose impediments, but if you fashion them into a bench, now you have a movable obstruction. Okay? The exceptions, again, are the integral objects and the boundary objects. An, an obstruction that can be moved with reasonable effort without damaging the obstruction and without damaging the course. Okay? Pretty simple there, talking about it. Okay? Some examples are stakes, except boundary objects that we just talked about. Golf carts, waste containers, benches, player equipment, which is a very big change there. Player equipment is now considered a movable obstruction. So that rules that will apply for movable obstructions apply to your equipment. Flag sticks and rakes are also movable obstructions, but flag sticks and rakes also have special rules involved with them as well. Okay? When is a rake not a movable obstruction? When you're holding it. Now, when you're holding it, what is it? Equipment. Okay? So the equipment's involved in that. So depending on what the situation, if the ball's in motion or something's going on, it's, it's involved with it being equipment, which necessarily isn't movable obstruction for that specific rule. So it just depends on what's going on. It's a very rare situation, but I just wanted to point it out that just there's different situations for different types of equipment and different types of objects as well. Okay? Movable parts of a movable obstruction are treated as a movable obstruction. Okay? What's an example of that? Fence, a stone inside of a fence, maybe a gate to a fence, something like that, unless it's meant to be closed, which is interesting. So we'll get to that point here as well, except when the movable part is not meant to be moved. So like if we have a stone in here, part of this wall, if it's loose, can we move it? No, it's not meant to be. It's part of that wall. Okay? That makes sense there? That's, why, that's what this rule specifically says. Except when the movable part is not meant to be moved. It's supposed to be part of that wall. That's what they're talking about. Rare situation. I hope we don't have this come over the radio at all. I don't think we will. <laughs> but the definition is you've got to be clear, or at least try to be clear. All right. Removable of a movable obstruction without penalty. A player may remove a movable obstruction anywhere on or off the golf course and may do so in any way. So it sounds very similar to a loose impediment. Here are the two exceptions. Exception one, T markers must not be moved. We talked about this uh, before. Whenever the ball is in the teeing area, those T markers may not be moved. And that doesn't, that, if it's in play or not in play. Okay? Again, the rules uniform across there. So T markers must not be moved. Okay? Exception two, deliberately moving a movable obstruction to affect the ball in motion. And I think I've talked about this uh, video many times that I still can't get a hold of this video. It's a great video. Corey Pavin hit a bunker shot at Southern Hills and is rolling toward that hazard at the time, penalty area now. Caddy lifts the rake, and the ball goes right past where the rake was and right into the penalty area. So Corey got a penalty for his caddy moving the movable obstruction, and his ball went to a hazard. And his caddy, I think, is selling insurance now. <laughs> so, I don't know what he's doing, but I don't think he's caddying for Corey. He wasn't very, very soon after that. All right. So we good on that? The two exceptions? Perfect. All right, so if the player's ball moves while he or she is removing a movable obstruction, there is no penalty, and the ball must be replaced on its original spot, and if it's not known, we're going to estimate it. Notice it doesn't say anything about a part of the golf course, does it? It's everywhere. Any, anywhere you move a movable obstruction, you move a beer can in a penalty area and your ball moves, no penalty, replace the ball. Throw the beer can somewhere away or recycle it. 
All right, relief when the ball is on or mo uh, movable obstruction anywhere on the course except the putting green. Okay, here's the example of when your ball comes to rest on a towel or a, a bag or something like that. The player may take free relief by lifting the ball, removing the removable obstruction, and dropping the original ball or another ball in the relief area. And we're talking about the relief area. Okay, can we substitute a ball here? Yes, again, it's a dropping situation. So we get to, we get to uh, substitute a ball if we want, okay? So the reference point is the estimated point right under the, where the ball was at rest in or on the movable obstruction. So the old rule, that's where we tried to drop it, but now it becomes our reference point. So that's where we're starting our relief area from is this new reference point that we've come up with. Size of the relief area from the reference point is one club length with the following limits. Must be the same area of the course as the reference point and not near the hole, okay? So if your ball is sitting on the fringe on a towel, we're going to lift the ball, remove the towel, and then we're going to have a reference point right underneath where the ball was. Create a relief area that's one club length, no near the hole. It cannot go onto the green. It has to be on the same area of the course, according to these limitations. And we're going to drop the ball in that relief area. When you said one club length, mm -hmm. it's still the stipulation, all the clubs except the uh, longest club length. Yeah, definition of club length is set. Definition of club length is the longest club in your bag that is not a putter. Always. Not a putter. Yep. Yep, always. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, we can go from rough to fairway because th those are the same area of the golf course. Yeah, the, the, uh, the five areas of the golf course are defined. One of them is not fairway or rough. So, good question. All right. When the relief, uh, the relief for the situation when the ball is on the putting green. So what we're going to do is the same situation. We're going to lift the ball, remove the, the movable obstruction, and now we're going to place the original ball or another ball on the estimated spot where the ball was underneath the movable obstruction. So it's the same rule as it was before. If it's on the putting green, now we're placing it instead of dropping it. Okay. No need for a reference point, no need for a relief area. We're actually putting it on a point. Okay. And we've got these different rules that we can talk about, how to replace it that we talked about last week. What if it doesn't stay put? We know what to do now because we just studied it and we're all on top of it, right? Perfect. All right, any questions on those procedures? Uh huh. So the, the large boulder that Tiger moves. Uh, first of all, that's going to be a loose impediment instead of an obstru obstruction. That will be but, a loose but it is going to be the same principles are going to apply for a loose impediment as a obstruction. Reasonable effort. Reasonable effort. Getting some people to help you is reasonable. It is. Getting some people to help you is, is fine. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. If you can show me somewhere in the rules where there's a definition of the weight limit of a loose impediment and an obstruction, we'll deal with that. But if we're not going to damage the course, if we can get some people in there and it's not going to take a lot of time, this has even happened recently. This happened again about two, two weeks ago. I saw it happen again uh, where a player had somebody come in and move a big rock out of the way. Had three or four people come in and do that. Uh huh. Yeah, as long as it's not attached or growing. Yeah, absolutely. You, you can you can use some reasonable effort, which includes people helping you. So, and actually, when people are helping, if you notice the tiger situation and this other player, they weren't involved in it; they were watching. <laughs> and so they they enlisted some help. They didn't really you know do any of the work on their own. So. But a good question, and, and, and you know, we all think about the Tiger situation, and it is a correct ruling, and it is the same thing going forward. So. Loose impediments on the green. Mm -hmm. You hit your putt, and one of the other players runs over and picks up the loose impediment mm -hmm. while your ball's in motion. Right. So if, if we have a putt on the putting green, let's say Lynn and I are playing, and Lynn hits a putt, we're playing stroke play, and I run over there and I pick up a loose impediment that is on his line that's going to affect his ball in motion, who gets the penalty, Lynn or Todd? I do. I do. Yep. All right. All right, so now let's talk about relief for a ball not found in a, a movable obstruction. So this is pretty rare, um, but uh, you may hit, a, may hit a ball into a trash can, and the trash can is movable with little effort, but you might not find it or might not want to find it. You might not want to dig through there. Um, that's okay. Um, but if it's known or virtually certain that it came to rest in a movable obstruction on the course, we may use this relief option instead of stroke and distance, so we don't have to treat this as a lost ball. 
Okay. So for example, boom, the great USGA stuff there. All right, so the ball crossed into the, the trash can at the red X, and we're going to go back with this funky little arrow. That's what that is. It's not a ribbon or something else. And point it to the point on the ground where it crossed, and that's going to become our reference point. Okay, so it's going to be right where the, it crossed the margin of that movable obstruction. Okay, so we're not going to estimate where the ball is. We actually have a point that has been created for us. Okay, a little bit of a different situation there. Okay, we're going to use that as the reference point, and then we're going to put another ball in play based on a, a relief area of one club length. It's just going to be treated like a uh, obstruction at this point. So now we have a one point. Now we've just got the one club length, no near the hole, same area of the golf course. We're going to get it in there. So once we put a ball in play to take relief in this way, and how do we put a ball in play again? Dropping it, wins it in play. As soon as it's not touching your hand anymore, it's falling through the air in play. So once that happens, the original ball is now no longer a factor. Okay? Must not be played. And even if we happen to find that ball outside of the trash can. Okay, so like we have virtual certainty that that ball is in the trash can. Virtually certain. Which is what percentage? 95. 95. Beautiful. Love it. So we're certain that ball is in the trash can, but we find it somewhere else. We are still correctly going by the rules operating here with the virtual certainty of the ball being in the movable obstruction. But if we find the original ball, we just have to discard it. We, we just leave it there. Or you can put it in your bag. You can do whatever you want with it. You just can't play golf with it on that hole. All right. Relief for ball not found, but in or on a movable obstruction. So if it is not known or virtually certain that the ball came to rest on a movable obstruction and the ball is lost, the player must take stroke and distance relief. So if you're 94% or less sure, that the ball is in that trash can, you have to go into stroke and distance. Okay? Everybody good on that? Question. Yes? You can move the trash can, you cannot move the trash can. You can move the trash can. That's fine. Okay. Well, that is, what goes to my mind is TIL versus Google. Right. So we can move the trash can, and if we move our ball, why are we not penalized? Because we're searching for it. We're not sure where it is. You know, so you can do that. Plus, if you also move an obstruction in your ball moves, there's no penalty anyway. So, but the procedure for this is going to be, we're going to have the ball go into this movable obstruction. We can't find it. We're going to get that reference point estimated. We're going to move the trash can out of the way and then use our one club length on this estimated point. Even if that ball happens to be in the trash can, or if it's not, but we still had virtually certainty that it was in there. Right, because that's, that's going to be a different rule. So that's right. That's going to be, that's right, and that's going to be under rule 16. Not, yes. Because it's a dropping for that arrow shows, right. dropping it to the right, but it, but it is a movable obstruction. That's the, the trash can is a movable obstruction. So if you actually took relief away from the movable obstruction, what do we have going on there? We're going to have a wrong place because you're, you're going to be dropping the ball in the wrong place because you're not allowed to take relief away from a movable obstruction. You have to move the obstruction out of the way and then, then get your relief that way. So, all right. Yep. Yeah, sure, sure. You could put it back. You could put it back in play. You could put your original ball back in play. But I was just being kind of general, I think, with that statement that I made. But yeah, if you can always put a ball back in play if you were allowed to, you could put one that you've taken out back in. All right. So again, like we just mentioned in that situation, playing the incorrectly substituted ball or playing from a wrong place is going to be the general penalty. And again, the multiple breaches will be on 1.3C4. All right. Any other questions on that? In a movable obstruction, be also an So can, can a movable obstruction be an immovable obstruction? And the answer is yes, if the committee declares it. So if something is a movable obstruction, we can move it by definition with a little bit of effort, no damage. It's movable. It falls underneath that definition. The committee can say, like, you want, we want all of our trash cans to stay in place. They are now immovable obstructions. We use, uh, we use something kind of similar to that when we're at swope. 
when we have in course out of bounds, we deem the stakes between four and five, excuse me, treat the stakes, it's a deem, treat the stakes as immovable obstructions when you're playing the fourth hole. Okay, so we've de determined that these movable obstructions cannot be moved because they're defining out of bounds on a different hole. That's why we've done that. That's a good example of on the other, side. other side, they're boundary objects. When you're playing hole five, they become boundary objects. When you're playing hole four, they're immovable obstructions by our hard, or not our hard card, our terms of the competition. So yes, you can do that. Right. Yeah, and that's they'll put signage and stuff like that. That's a good example. And they might be treated as TIOs, or they might be treated as movable or immovable obstructions. Chances are it's going to be a TIO to where you're going to get relief for line of play. But yeah, you, that's a good example there because they, they're sometimes just small little banners stuck in the ground. They're easily moved, but the committee is treating them as immovable. Good example. As an official, no. No, we can't, we can't do that. that. Because by definition, it is a movable obstruction. And we can't just pick and choose what we're changing definitions of. You can help them move the trash can. If you don't mind getting a little, if you get a little dirty, so. But yeah, there's, there's situations there with the golfer. I mean, we're, we, we like to side with the player, I like to say. But that's one of those situations where like, you just got to play hard. I mean, if, if somebody's going to hit a shot from like a penalty area where there's some mud, and he's going to get dirty. He's not going to get free relief. He's got to play it. You know, it's one of those things. So, well, if there's a snake in the trash can, you know, let's let's keep the really weird situations. You know, <laughs> is a raccoon a dangerous animal to you, Ray? I don't know. All right, we'll, we'll see. All right, so let's move on. All right, ball or ball marker helping or interfering with play. So a ball on the putting green is helping play now. Okay, it has the ball has to be on the putting green to help play. And the biggest example of this is what? What do we usually see with helping play? the backstop situation with the ball being left on the green as a backstop. No. Ball interfering with play can be anywhere on the golf course. So no matter where you're playing golf, we could have interference. A ball marker helping or interfering with as well. Same situation. Okay, some significant changes. Again, ball assisting play becomes ball helping play. I don't know if that's significant, but that's just different wording. It's applicable only when helping balls on the putting green. I've mentioned this a couple times, so it must be important. And procedures for the ball marker helping or interfering are added to the rules. So we used to not actually have that in the rules about a ball marker being in your way, but now it's included in the rules. So, all right, so if a player reasonably believes that a ball on the putting green might help anyone's play, okay, so what does this mean? Let's make, be very clear on this. Yeah. So, yeah, the old fellow competitor, exactly, which I think is just now a player. I don't know how they do it, but I know exactly what you're talking about. So if we have A, B, and C in a uh, threesome playing just stroke play golf, and A thinks B's ball is going to help C, A can have B's ball marked. Even if C doesn't want it marked, A can have it marked because it's helping. That's the, that makes sure we understand that. Now, this isn't a change. This is the way it's always been. But just want to be clear on that. Okay? So the player may mark the spot of the ball or lift it under Rule 13.1b if it's his ball, so you don't get to go mark somebody else's ball. You, have to mark, you can mark your own ball. But if the ball belongs to another player, require that other player to mark the spot of the ball and lift it. Okay. Again, the ABC example I just gave you. The lifted ball must be replaced on its original spot. Okay. So again, if the ball must be replaced, we have to mark it. So that's one of those situations that we are going to have to mark the ball. We can't just pick it up. Okay. Stroke play only. A player who is required to lift the ball may play first instead. Again, not a change. We've done this before. If two or more players agree to leave a ball in place to help any player and that player then makes a stroke with the helping ball left in place, each player who made the agreement gets the general penalty. Okay, so this is a little bit of a change to the rule. Okay, does anybody know what the rule used to be? Once the agreement was made, you're both disqualified. That was it. How about that? That was pretty strict, huh? But now the rule is, if you make an agreement and then a stroke is made with those balls in place, now the agreement people get two strokes each. Okay. Is that a general principle now? General principle for... In terms of agreement, if you and I agree to, uh, uh, I don't know, to give an example. Like to, to waive a rule of golf? To waive a rule of 
That's, now that's going to be disqualification. That's another rule underneath itself. If two players agree to waive a rule of golf, that's, that's under rule one. This is, not, this is a specific rule here. This is specifically with a ball helping. So like if, if you, you, me, and Bill are all playing together in a stroke play competition and your ball's near the hole, and I say, hey, let's, uh, let's leave your ball there so I can help it. And Bill's like, yeah, you need to leave it there to help him. We three have agreed to this now. Now all three of us are going to get two strokes if I make a stroke with the ball in place. So it's not agreement to waive a rule in this situation. It's agreement to violate a rule. A big difference there. Even if we didn't know that we were breaking this rule. Even if you didn't know you were breaking this rule, you're going to be penalized. This is one of those rules where if you agreed to it, you're going to get penalized. So. If you knew it was a violation of a rule, that's a good point there. So if we know we're violating a rule and saying, well, I'm still going to leave it there, now we got a situation where we can DQ the player. That's a very good point because now we're, trying to, we're just waiving a rule. Oops. All right. In match play, opponents may agree to leave the helping ball in place. Okay? So stroke play, this is a situation, but in match play, it's just you and the side. If you guys want to leave it there, fine. It's your, it's your match. Who cares? Right? That's what this rule is saying. This is a bit of a change and kind of counterintuitive to what the stroke play rule is, but in match play, go ahead. If you guys want to do it, it's fine. No, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. Boy, I'm one down here on the last hole, and my ball's going to help you. Well, there you go. You know, no. I don't think we want to do that. So, All right. So everybody good on the helping? Understand the difference, and it has to be on the putting green? All right. Meaning of interference of a, by another player's ball. So interference under this rule exists when another player's ball at rest, and make sure that we understand again the difference between interfering and helping. It might interfere with the player's area of intended stance or area of intended swing. Is on or close to the player's line of play such that given the intended stroke, there's a reasonable chance the player's ball in motion could hit that ball. Okay? Pretty straight, straight, uh, straightforward stuff. Or is close enough to distract the player in making the stroke. Okay? So if I have a, I'm, I got a ball right here and I'm getting ready to hit it and Bob's ball is a couple inches away, maybe a foot away, but it's in my line of sight, I can go ahead and have him mark that ball because it's distracting me. Okay, and like Bruce and I were talking earlier, there's some other things that you can't move that are a distraction, but a golf ball you can. So if a golf ball is in your way and it's distracting you, it's not even on your line of play, you're allowed to have it removed. That is the difference in that rule this year. I believe it is. I believe it is a change. Yeah, yeah, I believe it is a change. Yeah. Yeah, so now we can move the ball if it's a distraction. Most anything else you cannot. Loose impediments you can, you know, things like you get to move stuff. Um, but like if, if you're distracted by a sprinkler head, you're not going to get relief from, from the sprinkler head in that situation. So if the sprinkler head's a foot away right. and it's in your line of sight, that's an example where you don't get relief. Well, that's why I was trying to clarify. Yep, yep. But anything that's movable, you can move in that situation, except a boundary object and so on and so forth. You cannot clean it in this situation, absolutely. So when, when we do this, you can't clean it. So if the player reasonably believes that another player's ball anywhere on the course might interfere with that player's own play, okay? So what does this mean? This is very, very important to understand this one. Okay, so if I think a ball is interfering with me, I can have it removed. If Gary thinks a ball is interfering with me, Gary can't have it removed. It's up to the player. I always like to pick things that Gary can't do. So... The player is the only person that can have a ball interfering with moved, okay? Because the player is the one who's going to make the stroke and knows what they want to do. Look at it that way. It's the best way to remember that one. So you can't have an A, B, C situation in this one. This is only A and B, okay? Player may require the other player to mark the spot of the ball, and the ball must not be cleaned except when it's on the putting green. We're always allowed to clean the ball there. It must be replaced on the original spot. Since it must be replaced, we've got to mark it, okay? We'll get to that. We'll get to the we'll get to the ball marker. Okay. Uh, question for you. Yep. Um, let's say uh, <coughs> an opponent's ball is in my line of play, not on the putting green. Okay. And it's it has left the pitch mark. It's sitting in the pitch mark. It's partially embedded. Okay. I request that player to lift their ball so that I can play. Mm -hmm. And I request him to fix the ball mark. When was the pitch mark created? That's the question. Yep. Yeah. So the question was, 
A ball is on the line of play interfering with you, but it's also embedded. Okay. Can we fix the pitch mark when we remove the ball for interference? And the answer is yes, if your ball was at rest and then the ball came in. No, in other situations. Yep. All right. So if the other player does not mark the spot of the ball when we ask them to do it um, before lifting it or cleans the lifted ball when not allowed, he or she's going to get one penalty stroke. So this, that whole situation, if we do the procedure wrong, one penalty stroke. Uh-huh. And Ryan gets his balls and it flies right in front of me also on the front. Uh-huh. And it's right in my line. Uh-huh. So Ryan can move his ball and fix his pitch mark. You can have him fix his pitch mark. Yes. Because it's it's up to you. His ball was at first. Yeah, yeah. His ball your ball was at rest first. So yeah, that's where you get to do that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So in stroke play only, a player required to lift or his ball under this rule may play first instead. So the helping and the assisting, or excuse me, the helping and the interfering is the same thing with stroke play. We can go ahead and play if you want. Example here, if the ball's interfering with play, just, just go ahead and tap it in. That's fine. <coughs> okay, when relief is not allowed from interfering uh, ball, a player is not allowed to lift his or her ball under this rule based on only the player's belief that the ball might interfere with another player's play. I mentioned that before. So. Again, it's not an A, B, C situation. It's just A and B. If, if A's ball gets in B's ball's way, or B's play's way, then we can do it. But C can't come in and say, you, you have to mark that. Right. Make sure we're clear on that. So if a player lifts his or her ball when not required to do so by the other player, except when the ball's in the putting green, the player's going to get one penalty stroke. And I have a question coming up on this that I'll explain it even a little bit better. Okay. Talking about the ball marker. Okay, the ball marker has its own rule in this under 15.3c now. A ball marker might help or interfere with a player. A player may move the ball marker out of the way if it's his or her own, or if the ball marker belongs to any other player, require that that ball marker be moved for the same reasons the ball may be moved. Okay? And the reason why this is put up here is because, and it's separate, is there were some just kind of different little things that would happen with a ball marker and a ball, like am I supposed to mark the ball and then move the marker, am I supposed to move the ball, then mark it, and things like this. So they kind of separated it out to just clarify everything and just say, you know what, the ball marker and the ball are the same, but we're just going to make sure that everybody's clear on that. Right. The ball marker must be moved out of the way, and the new spot measured from its original spot, such as using one or more club, links, club head lengths. And again, that's an example, such as one club head length. You can move it a whole club if you want. You can move it, you could walk it off or what, something, however you want to do it. However you want to measure, it's fine. Okay. And if we, uh, we do this wrong and we play from a wrong place, there's your general penalty in that situation. There's no uh, clear uh, situation in terms of process of marking the ball in two club lengths? Or yeah, there, actually, it's, it's vague for a reason. There's, there's no measurement of how we're supposed to, to do it because... But there's no uh, sequence. No, nope, there's no you sequence. Do it in one way and then do it another what way. What the rule wants you to do now is get the ball back in the right place. That's all we want to do. I know the decisions before talked about if you do it one way, you do it backwards to get it back in place. We just want the ball replaced where it's supposed to. And it says there in the rule it must be replaced on the original spot. So that takes care of it. Okay. All right. The penalty also applies to the player if he makes a stroke without waiting for helping or a ball marker or ball marker to be lifted or removed after becoming aware that the another player intended to lift or move it under this rule or had somebody else or required somebody else to do so. or refuses to lift his or her ball or move his or her ball marker when required to do so, and a stroke is made. You know, so an example there is I have, you know, Bob, I say, move your ball marker, and he just says no. Okay, he's penalized if I make a stroke in that situation because I asked him to do it. So, so the old uh, situation now, if I'm putting and I see a ball marker, and I'm using that ball marker as a spot for me to hit it mm -hmm. my line of play, mm -hmm. I can still do that, right? Sure, sure. If we have a ball marker that's on the green already, we can use it as an alignment or something we're going to aim at. That's fine. Not a problem. But if somebody says, uh, I want to replace that ball marker or move it. Yeah, if, if, the, if a player wants to move his ball marker at any point because he thinks it's going to help you, he, he can move it. Right. He, can, he has the right to move it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. That's true. That's true in an area other than the putting green as well. Absolutely. On the golf course, anywhere. In that, exactly, exactly, exactly. 
All right, so here's the question I was referring to here. In stroke play, Todd's ball rests on the green, three feet behind the hole. Todd says to Taylor, I will leave my ball there as a backstop for you. And Taylor says, thanks. Neither player is aware this is a violation of the rules. Which of the following is true? Okay, we kind of hit this pretty hard. Do we have a penalty situation here, we think? Why is it a penalty? Agreement was made. The fact that we don't know, realize it's not a violation doesn't matter at this point. So Taylor makes a stroke. Both players will get a penalty. We can get out of it by marking the ball. What, Todd got a penalty by <laughs> Trick question. Gotcha. I think this is number three in the last five years. So, no. Yeah, so if Taylor does make a stroke, both of us are going to get a penalty in that situation because the agreement was in place and now a stroke was made. But again, we could have got out of it if the ball was marked. Even if we agreed and said, wait a minute, no, we've got to fix that, then we'd be fine. The old rule would have DQ'd us right away. So, okay. Players and stroke player are not allowed to agree to leave a helping ball in place. If a stroke is made with the ball and agreement in place, each player gets the general penalty. The penalty still applies even if they didn't know it was a violation. If they knew it was a violation, they are disqualified in that situation. Okay. And again, it says stroke play. If Taylor and I were opponents in a match, we can do whatever we want. That would be fine. No penalty there. Mm -hmm. According to definition. In, in most situations. Yep. In that case, you couldn't get out of it by the ball marker. If you thought that the ball marker was helping somebody and you said, let's leave it in place to help me or something like that, you could get out of it by moving it out of the way. Because you, you could move it in that situation. Say, well, let me move it off that helping spot and there would be no penalty. That makes sense? Yeah. All right, any other questions on 15 before we move into 16? There is a, uh, I, I mentioned that I was going to have a question for you. I think that question I was talking about, about a ball being marked and lifted, is on the quiz. So I think we'll go over that at the end. That's what I was thinking of there. So, heard my name. Um, I'd have to look into that one. So is, can a ball marker be moved if it's somewhere else? Um, I think it can be. Like, for example, two balls are kissing, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move one, and I put a ball marker down. I can move that ball marker out of the way so I don't hit the ball marker. Uh, same thing with a bunker. You see that a lot if somebody's going to hit a shot out of a bunker. So I think you can move in any, any, any spot. No. All right. No more questions about 15. We're moving on. Chance. All right. Rule 16 is going to talk about abnormal course conditions, which used to be abnormal ground conditions. Um, dangerous animal condition, which has been uh, really well defined, it used to be a rule of equity. Now it actually has its own special rule within the rules. The embedded ball, that procedure has changed a little bit. We'll go through that. And then lifting a ball to see if it lies in a condition where relief is allowed. So this, uh, this new Rule 16 has a whole bunch of old rules kind of thrown in together to create this rule. Significant changes, again, abnormal course conditions is a definition. It includes ground under repair, temporary water, which used to be casual water, animal holes, which used to be a hole, a cast, or a runway, and again, it is an animal hole, not a burrowing animal hole, and immovable obstructions are now included in an abnormal course condition. It used to have just kind of its own definition, but now it's included underneath the definition of an abnormal course condition. Relief for holes, casts, and worn tracks made by any animal. Of course, any animal has its exception, except worms and insects, which are loose impediments. So now we get relief from a dog hole, from a dog digging a hole. All right, this rule covers free relief that is allowed from interference by animal holes, ground under repair, immovable obstructions, or temporary water. Every abnormal course condition. And each one of those has its own little definition as well. All right, so relief is allowed anywhere, okay, with some exceptions. If your ball is in a penalty area, we're not allowed relief from casual water, excuse me, temporary water. Um, but it's, your ball's in the hazard, or excuse me, hold on, I'm all like 2018 stuff going on here. Uh, so if your ball is in a penalty area, you can't have temporary water inside of it. It's part of the penalty area, okay? If your ball is in a penalty area and there's a bridge interfering with you, you don't get relief, okay? So if your ball's in a penalty area, that's what we're going to deal with. 
We're about a bunker with different rules. We have different rules. It's a different area of the golf course. And we'll go over those here in a little bit. An abnormal course condition is not on the golf course. Okay? So if you have something that is off the golf course, you don't get relief from it. Okay? Anything that is off the golf course. Now, you get to move loose impediments, but you don't get to get relief from an abnormal course condition that's off a golf course. Clearly unreasonable stroke or play choices. Okay? We talked about this before, of taking a weird stance, or if your ball is like in a tree root, and you're standing on the cart path, and you clearly can't play the ball out of the tree root, you don't get relief from that cart path, because you just can't play it. So. Mm -hmm. So the old rule used to be if there were um, worm tailings mm -hmm. on the fringe, right. you could go ahead and brush those away. Now you can't. I know you can't now, and I don't remember what the old rule was, if it was specific for that or not. It was a cast was it? from a yeah. borrowing animal. Yeah, but it's not, it's not anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's, it's not considered part of the, an, it's not an animal hole. If it's just going to be like dirt or sand from a worm, dirt and sand and loose soil don't count as being able to be moved when they're on the fringe. No. All right. This rule does not give free relief from movable obstructions. We just talked about that. So if you're looking for a movable obstruction, that's the previous rule. And again, we talked about boundary objects and integral objects where no free relief is allowed. So we got uh, a movable obstruction there on the left, to actually a couple of them right there next to that player. And then we have a boundary fence, no free relief. And then we've got these stones inside the penalty area that are stacked as a wall. That's an integral object, no free relief from that. So if your ball was just outside of the penalty area and you were standing on that wall, you have to play it as it lies. You don't get free relief in that situation. Okay. When relief is allowed for the definition of what interference is, if the ball touches, if the ball is in or on, or your intended, your intended stance has interference from any of these objects, as well as your intended swing, or on your line of play on the putting green. So there's a lot of things that can happen to get you interference in an abnormal course condition. So putting green is only going to talk about the line of play. Now we have a temporary movable obstruction that you could get relief from for a line of play, but that is not a rule of golf. That is going to be a local rule. Distraction alone is not an interference. So they point that out here as well. So if you're just distracted by a puddle of water near you, sorry, we're not going to give you free relief. Okay. So if the abnormal course condition is close enough to distract that player but does not meet any of those requirements, there's no interference under this rule. There's a great example of it right there. So the ball is lying on, on the turf, no problem. The sprinkler head is in between the stance and the, the ball, no relief in the situation. Okay. Even if that person has a bit of a stance that is on the ground that starts to slope in a little bit, that because there's a sprinkler head there, if you're not actually touching the sprinkler head, you don't get relief. The surface of the ground isn't going to give you that relief. Uh, talk, talk a little bit about the area around the sprinkler head. Mm -hmm. and, uh, relief, not relief. <coughs> right, the indented part, like I, like I was saying, if, if, some, if there's an indentation going down, you're not going to get relief if that's the only interference you have. You actually have to have interference of a physical nature against the immovable obstruction. So, if it, unless the committee has declared it uh, ground under repair or something like that, but in general, no, no, you need to have actual physical interference. Okay. All right. So, no relief when clearly unreasonable to play a ball. So, here's a couple of examples here: a ball up in a cactus pinned up against there. Uh, a couple feet out of the air, we have a ball that's in a tree root there. This is a, a standard relief, a result of a shot of mine on the bottom there. It usually comes to rest in the root because I don't hit it in the fairway very often. So when playing the ball is at, when we're playing the ball as it lies, it's clearly unreasonable in these situations uh, because of something other than the abnormal course condition, such as when a player is standing in temporary water or on an immovable obstruction, but is unable to make a stroke because of where the ball lies in a bush. Another great example of the new rules, having examples, just saying, here's what we're talking about, instead of trying to figure it out. You do not get relief in this situation. Okay? And when interference also exists only because a player chooses a club, a type of stance, or a type of swing or direction of play that is clearly unreasonable under the circumstances. Okay? Took his stance, he was just fine, and said, you know what, I think I can make a widen my stance for this shot. Clearly unreasonable for him to do that. We would not grant this player relief. 
I, I think we still be clearly unreasonable in this situation, unless you play with, with this guy all day and that's his normal stance. Yeah. I mean, if, it, if it's his normal stance, then he's, he's entitled to relief. So we, we probably know a couple players like that that just don't have ideal setups in golf. It does happen. All right, so let's talk about what we're going to do if we do have interference underneath this rule. Uh, we, the reference point is the nearest point of complete relief in the general area. It is the nearest point of complete relief. So that means if you're taking relief from an immovable obstruction, you cannot have any type of interference from it wherever that point is. You can't still be standing on a part of the cart path or standing on that sprinkler head or follow through and clip that sprinkler head or cart path. You can't do that. You have to get complete relief in this situation. The relief area is going to be one club length from that reference point, no nearer the hole. In the general area, we're talking about this general area relief here as well, so it has to be in the general area. Again, no nearer the hole than the reference point. And you must, again, take complete relief from the situation. So pretty straightforward there. If we have an abnormal course condition here, taking complete relief from it. Okay, All the way back, can't be standing on that white line, can't be uh, following through and making a divot on the white line, got to take complete relief. So when you do take, you don't take complete relief, the stroke counts and you add stroke? Yes, so if we don't take complete relief, what's going to happen is we're going to have the stroke count, but we're going to get the general penalty in this situation. <coughs> Two strokes, or loss of hole in match play. All right, so now if we're in a bunker, we got a ball that's in a bunker and we have uh, an abnormal course condition, the nearest point of complete relief has to stay in the bunker. Okay, and the relief area is going to be one club length in the bunker, and it's not nearer the hole than the reference point. And then if we can't find a spot where we get complete relief, we get maximum relief. Okay? So we might have to still drop a little bit in some water or stand in a little bit in some water if you don't want a penalty. So we have to keep that ball in the bunker. This procedure hasn't changed, it's the same as it always has been. Um, but if you want free relief in a bunker and you can't get maximum relief, or can't get total relief, you use maximum relief. Everybody clear on that? What was the situation years ago with Payne Stewart and I get taken full relief? I don't remember. It was, it was on a cart path. The, the, yeah. Payne, the Payne Stewart example, he took relief from a, from a cart path, yeah. and then he took his stance and his heels were still on the cart path. And then he, Why did he do that? He just, I mean, you, I'm, he, just, he must have done it by accident or something. I don't know. But all I know is he violated the rule and he got it. I think it was pretty, pretty clear all around it. But, yeah, I don't know why he did it, but he ended up getting a two-stroke penalty for that. Okay. We can use back-on-the-line relief procedure if we want to take the ball out of the bunker for a one-stroke penalty. And this is true if you have interference of any abnormal course condition and you still have relief in the bunker, you can still use this option if you want. You can go ahead and take it out for one penalty stroke. Okay, so we're going to go outside the bunker, and it can be on any part of the golf course. So you can drop this into a penalty area if you want. Okay, but we're going to talk about it. it must not be near the hole for the, the reference point. It must not be near the hole, and the relief area is going to be in any area of the course. But if it's more than one area of the course is located within that relief area, the ball has to stay in that relief area that it first hit. So if that relief area happens to go over two, golf, two different parts of the golf course, such as a penalty area and the general area, where that ball hits, it's got to stay in that area. So the, the relief area might be divided in some sort of way in that situation. Okay. But this is available for a one-stroke penalty if you're ever interfered with, like, say, some steps in a bunker or a drain or temporary water or an animal hole. You can take it out of the bunker for one penalty stroke on the back-of-the-line procedure. Okay. That's an unplayable lie. And we'll talk about that next week. Talk about the unplayable lie next week in a bunker. All right, everybody good on that procedure? All right, so now if we have a ball on the putting green, the nearest point of complete relief is still going to exist somewhere, so we've got to find that. We've got an abnormal course condition here on the green, so we're going to get complete relief. Fortunately, you can see we've got a left-handed putter here, so the ball is going to be pretty close to that puddle of water. In, in taking complete relief. Okay, we're going to place the original or another ball in that spot. So again, the ball's in the putting green. This is a placing situation on that exact spot. No relief area needed. It must be on the putting green or in the general area. So we might have a situation here where the nearest point of relief is in the general area, and we have to take that. 
We don't get to say, well, I want to be on the putting green and go over here. It's not the nearest point. The nearest point is going to be the nearest point period. And it may be on the putting green or it may be in the general area. Okay? Good on that one? That's not a change. That's not a change. It's the way it's always been. All right? If not, no complete relief is available, again, my favorite example here is I'm not playing golf. I'm not out there, so I can't help you with this ruling. But we're going to find the maximum available relief as a reference point. So if we have a circle of water around this hole like this, we find the place where there's the least amount of water in our way, and that is going to be our relief point. We're going to place it there, whether it's on the putting green or the general area. Uh -huh. If that's how you're believing that that is his maximum relief, that, that, that that's not a problem. Yeah, we're going to let the player use their best judgment. Okay. Um, and if, you know, if they come up with something wrong, they're probably going to be okay still because we're letting them use their best judgment okay. in the situation. If there's a rules official, if you're there, you can help them through the procedure and say, you know what, I think that we might have a spot here that's better for you. And in that situation, if the rules official is pointing it out, then we have to go by that one. So, but generally, I'm going to let the player do what they want to do okay. and ask if they need any assistance through the procedure. I'm not going to point it out. If your belief is different, his belief is what carries the day. Yeah, if he's using reasonable judgment. You know, if he wants to putt through more water than you think he should, I don't know if that's reasonable, but it's his call, it's his call in that situation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, in the bunker. Okay. There's an area in the bunker, there's uh, temporary water in the bunker. Okay. Right. So here's, here's the question, and this is, this is, used to be a decision that has changed, actually. So there, there's a bunker that's got a lot of water in it, and the ball is in there, and he wants to take free relief, and the only spot that he can find is a little bit of sand kind of up on the slope, but it's still in the bunker, which he's required to take if he wants free relief. So he drops it, it hits the sand, rolls back in the water, picks it up, drops it, does it again, then he places it there in the sand, and if he can get it to sit, he's fine. He's going to play for, with no penalty. But if he can't get it to sit, now he has to go underneath an unplayable lie. There is no free relief in that situation. So unfortunately, that's, that's how that would work. So. That would explain why before, if you had rain the night before, why you were doing check bumpers. Absolutely. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, and, and that's why the KCGA staff gets out there and does it how they're supposed to. We're, we're on top of it because we're really good at it, I promise you on that one. But also, a good point that we bring up here is if, if we declare a bunker to be ground under repair and there's no play from it, it no longer has the status of a bunker. It is now the general area. So that is also something to consider. The committee can declare a bunker, ground under repair, and it is no longer a bunker. It becomes just the general area in which relief is available. Not mandatory unless you do make it mandatory by a local rule. So, um, yep. In that example If, if we can conclude that, that, that he is taking maximum available relief, yeah, we'd be all right. But, but I still would probably have a situation there where I'm thinking we have less water in a situation. The type of stroke. All right, exactly. I know. So, but that's a really good question. But I think we still need the maximum available relief in that situation. If he does it on his own and is making his best judgment, we're going to be okay. But if we're walking him through it, that's kind of where I'm going to say, no, I think we have less water over here. So, again, we're going to trust the player to do something right there. Yep. Right. 
Right. No, there's no choice in this situation. When we have a nearest point of relief, it is a point. It is not points. So, we, yeah, we don't let the choice in this situation. Right. There has to be water. And, and I do want to go over this. This is a good, good point here. What is interference from temporary water? It's, if it's interfering with your lie of your ball, your area of your intended swing, or your stance. Now, your stance is going to be where you're standing to make the stroke, not you know, pushing water down around the ball to get it to come up. And also, when you take your stance, water has to come up and stay. It can't just show up and then disappear right away. It act you actually have to have it huddled up there. It has to be in place for it to be interference. But again, your stance is where you're going to be standing to hit the stroke. You're, you can't have a player that you know, wants to push water around a ball, which you see all the time. Look, water's coming up. It's like, well, that's not where you're standing. That's not your stance. So that's how we define it. All right. So if we have an abnormal course condition and a ball is not found, we have to have knowledge of virtual certainty. Okay. So the starting point is going to be the estimated point where the ball last crossed the outer edge. We talked about this with a movable obstruction. Same situation. So we're going to have a spot on the course where the ball has crossed this abnormal course condition. It's going to become our starting point is what we're referred to. The reference point is the nearest point of complete relief from that starting point. Okay. Everybody clear on that? That's the same thing that we talked about the trash can. The starting point was going to be where it crossed up in the air, and then the reference point became the spot on the ground. And then we got the fr free relief from there. Okay, and the relief area is, we're going to use the apical relief area described in whatever rule we're going under. Okay. Got some examples going on here as well. But once the player puts another ball in play again to take relief from this play, that ball's in play and the original ball is not. Even if we find the original ball somewhere else. Again, we had virtual certainty it was one place. We're going to go ahead and go underneath that rule. Okay, virtual certainty is 95%, it's not 100%, so that's why sometimes the ball ends up somewhere else. All right, without knowledge of virtual certainty, this is pretty simple. What are we going to do? We're not going to give him relief. Stroke and distance is required if the ball is not found. Okay, pretty simple on that. Okay, any other questions on that? Okay, the procedure for the ball lost in a big puddle of water in a bunker is the one that we usually use in that situation where we're going to use the starting point where it crossed that big puddle and go from there. Everybody clear on that one? We can go through it if you want to, but we can go through it afterwards as well if you want to. So. All right, let's talk about a new concept called the no play zone, which is going to be involved in Rule 16 and moving forward in Rule 17 as well next week. Relief must be taken from interference by a no play zone in an abnormal course condition. This is generally, you're going to see this as like a flowered area, nice manicured, you know, landscaping area is going to be declared a no-play zone by the committee so that we're not taking out uh, flowers like Bill Murray did in Caddyshack. Um, but in each of these situations, the ball must not be played as it lies when the ball is in the no-play zone or when the no-play zone interferes with a stance swing for ball anywhere on the course except the penalty area. So again, when your ball is in a penalty area, we don't get free relief. and We don't have to take relief from a no-play zone in that situation. Okay. When the ball is in the no-play zone, if the player's ball is in that no-play zone, in or on an abnormal course condition, in the general area, in a bunker, or on the putting green, I still haven't come up with a good example of a no-play zone on a putting green, but <laughs> there might be out there. Okay. The no-play zone in the general area, the player must take free relief under 16.1b, so we have to take our relief away from that uh, abnormal course condition, just the way that we did in the procedure that we talked about. Okay. The no play zone is in the bunker, the player must take free relief or penalty relief. You have those two options. You can stay in the bunker or you can take it out of the bunker. So it's the same situation if the committee has declared a part of the bunker to be a no play zone. And the putting green, free relief under the same procedures that we just went through. Again, if you come up with a good example of a no play zone and a putting green, I'd like to hear it. Maybe in a newly sodded area, maybe, yeah, maybe just, that'd be a good way to do it. No play zone in the bunker, excuse me. I'm mm -hmm. Right. So if you're in a bunker in, in a no play zone, you can either use the option of free relief and drop away from it in the bunker, or you can do the one penalty stroke and take it out of the bunker on the back on the line relief, if you, if you choose. Okay. 
when a no-play zone interferes with a stance or swing for a ball anywhere on the course except a penalty area. Uh, so again, if the player's ball is outside a no-play zone and is in the general area, in a bunker, or on the putting green, and a no-play zone interferes with the intended stance or the swing, for what to do when there's interference by a no-play zone in a penalty area, we're going to go to the penalty area rule next week. So we'll talk about that specifically when we're getting that situation. So if you have interference with the stance or the swing, we're going to take the relief in the procedures we just talked about for a no-play zone. So it's not just your ball. It's also if your backswing happens to hit this nice flowered area. Or if you're on the putting green and your putt happens, your stroke happens to hit that little sod seam or something like that, you have to take free relief. So. Uh -huh. Your ball is probably going to hit that bush. Your, your, your ball is going to hit that bush when you play it. But you don't get relief. Yes, and, and the question is, if, so like if our line of play is interfered by a no-play zone, do we get free relief? No. It's the same thing as an immovable obstruction in that situation. So. Am I going the right way here? All right. Okay, again, the penalty area, no-play zone, we'll talk about next week. It's specific to Rule 17, so we don't have to worry about it here. All right, any other questions on the no-play zone? Sean? you can get relief from that. I know we can declare those as grounded repair and you can take free relief on that for but as far as like the actual rules of golf I, I'm going to double check on that one. I, I assume that we're going to give you free relief in that situation because it's on the putting green we get to move it anyway. But the hole yeah and as I was just going to say you also can fix damage in that situation as well um, but the committee if, if there's enough damage the committee can declare those ground under repair and then you can just move it off to the side. Um, but yeah, there's some other options there. Um. Um, no play zones uh, for us will probably be marked on the terms of the competition or on a hard card. Okay, so um, uh, courses are going to do it however they want to do it anyway. Uh -huh. um, so I mean they, they could put a stake with a green top or whatever they want to do it. But when we go to a tournament and we, we're there, we're going to point those out on the, the terms of the competition, as well as the, uh, the uh, sheet I give you hole by hole. It'll be on there. We'll, we will know. The player will know on the terms of the competition. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. All right, here's a question I have for you. In a stroke play event, Doug's ball is at rest after his tee shot in deep temporary water in a bunker. He does not have full free relief in the bunker, so he takes maximum available relief and drops a substituted ball in the right way in the relief area in shallow temporary water. Which of the following possibly multiple are correct? So I'm going to go through these one at a time and see what we think. Okay. Doug May plays the ball as it lies with no penalty. Has he done this all right? Yeah. Okay. Doug will be penalized two strokes if he plays the ball since he did not take full relief. Okay. Doesn't sound right, does it? Doug may lift the ball and under stroke and distance return to the tee playing his third stroke. I do have the answers coming up, I promise. Doug may lift the ball and proceed under back on the line option out of the bunker for a one-stroke penalty using the dropped ball as a reference point. Okay, now we're starting to get a little, little more yes and no's. The question I have for E might give you the answer to D. Doug may lift the ball and proceed under the back on the line option out of the bunker for a one-stroke penalty using the original ball in the deep water as the reference point. All right, so what do we think we can do here? A, we're good? Yeah. We can do A? Yeah. B, can we do B? No. no. C, can we go back to stroke and distance? Yes. Yep. D, sound good? D's good, and E's not. Okay. All right, so A, if full relief is not available, Doug may take the maximum available that we talked about, therefore he's proceeded correctly. Doug may lift the ball under stroke and distance once that ball is back in play. At any time, we get to go back and do stroke and distance from our last stroke. And D, Doug may lift the ball and proceed under the back of the line option out of the bunker because his ball's in play. He can now, now he can just take another penalty stroke and, and go, up, go back there using that ball in play's reference point. 
that make sense? So he took the maximum available relief and dropped it in some, some, some temporary water. And he's like, well, you know what? I don't want to play this. So now, but his ball is in play, right? We can agree to that, right? All right, so now he can proceed under the rules. And one of the rules is his ball's in a bunker interference with abnormal course condition. So now he can take it out, take the one-stroke penalty, and go in the back of the line. Does that make sense? So he gets to his option. He isn't changing an option, though. He's got a ball in play. His ball is back in play. He isn't changing an option at all. It's just, it's his, his ball's in play. It's like if you take an unplayable lie. If you're in a bush and you take an unplayable lie and you drop your ball, you can take another one if you want. You can keep on taking as much as you want. Your ball's in play once you drop it in that situation. He dropped it in the right way. Everything was done correctly. Ball in play. That makes sense? Right. His ball's in play. Absolutely. He still has options underneath the rules. Exactly. Exactly. Maybe. I mean, that's up to the player. I mean, the player might be better out of a small, shallow water bunker shot than he would be from back on the line if there's bushes or trees in the way or something. Yeah, but as far as the procedure goes, this is correct. Uh-huh. So if, he, if he, the player is trying to take full relief and drops it into the relief area, but full relief isn't available because it rolls into some water, his ball is in play underneath maximum available relief. His ball is in play. Right. It's, there's no drop, drop place in that situation. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. If, uh, if he drops the ball and it doesn't come into temporary water, and then he decides he doesn't want to play it that way, he goes back out, that's a true score. Correct. If he does not have interference from the abnormal course condition in that situation, you're right. So, so everybody hear that one? So if, if Doug is taking relief again, he dropped it into some, to some temporary water, but now wants to do the, uh, the relief situation and he drops it and is no longer interfered with, his ball is in the bunker and is no longer interfered with an abnormal course condition, and then he takes it out of the bunker, he's proceeding under the unplayable ball rule for a two-stroke penalty in that situation because he doesn't have, he's not proceeding under Rule 16. He does not have interference by an abnormal course condition. So it's a good, good point there. Uh, you take relief and you get full. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if, if the player's trying to get full relief, and this is kind of the question that Lynn was bringing up, if the player's trying to get full relief in that situation, they can drop it again. But if we're trying to do maximum available relief, relief right, exactly, exactly. It's good questions there. Everybody good with this? Threw one tricky one in there for you. All right, dangerous animal condition. Sorry about the snake, Jackie, don't look. I'm going to get off this, this thing real quick, I promise. So a dangerous animal condition exists when a dangerous animal, such as a poisonous snake, stinging bees, alligator, fire ants, or bears, just examples, not a complete list, um, is near a ball or could cause serious physical injury to the player if he or she had played the balls that lies. A player gets free relief under 16.2b from interference by a dangerous animal condition no matter where his or her ball is on the course. Okay, so this is true in a penalty area, bunker, teeing area, general area of the putting green. And we will go through those procedures. Okay, so when a ball is anywhere except the penalty area, the player may take relief under the procedures we just talked about, finding the nearest point. Uh, depending on whether the ball is in the general area, the bunker, the putting green, we're going to do certain ways. So when the ball is in a penalty area, first of all, the player may take free relief or penalty relief. The player has the option in that situation. Okay. Free relief from playing inside that penalty area, the player may take free relief under 16.1b, except that the nearest point of complete relief uh, and the relief area must be in the penalty area. Okay, I didn't highlight the, but I should have. Okay? You have to take relief in that penalty area. The old rule lets you find a similar penalty area or hazard at the time, but that is no longer the case. Okay? So, the player may take penalty relief under 17.1D. This is the relief for a penalty area, if you would like to, for outside of the hazard. We'll talk about that procedure, but hopefully we're all aware of what that's going to happen. 
So if there is interference by a dangerous animal condition where the ball would be played after taking this penalty relief outside the penalty area, the player may take further relief without penalty. So if you have a ball that is just inside of a penalty area and there's a, we'll say an alligator so I don't scare Jackie, and there's an alligator right there and you take penalty relief just, just out of the way of that penalty area and drop it there and you still think the alligator is in, uh, interfering with you, you can take further free relief and get out of the way. That's what that rule means. But now we're out of the penalty area for one penalty stroke. If you want free relief, you keep it in that penalty area. And so the way that procedure would work is we find the nearest point where there's no interference from a dangerous animal and drop it in that penalty area if you want free relief. But it has to be that penalty area. Right? Now, if we're, I just kind of glanced over like the general area, the putting green and all that stuff, but the procedure is the exact same as taking relief from an immovable obstruction. We're going to find the spot where there's no danger in the general area and then drop it in a relief area with one club length. Okay. But if you want free relief in a penalty area, you've got to stay in that penalty area. Or you can take the penalty area relief, one stroke, get out, and, and do all those options. But then if you take relief and you're still scared of the alligator, now you're outside in the general area with your ball in play, you can take further relief for free. Uh, once it, if you've picked up a ball and, and now the ball is to be replaced is, is going to be a penalty in that situation. Yeah, you don't pick, yeah, I'm not picking the ball up anyway, I'm not getting out of there. But, but that's what we also, when we're talking about getting relief situations for all situations, we want the ball to stay in place as much as possible. Don't lift it unless you're absolutely sure what you're going to do. Sure. Not going to take your time and Google it. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you, if you read the rule, it's set. No. No. If you, if you read the rule, it says if the player believes there is danger from an animal, you're, you're covered. So, I mean, there's people that are afraid of, you know, snakes that are this long. You know, that's, and if they believe there's danger, then they are entitled to relief. Yep. Good, good point there. We're not, the committee's not in charge of determining what's dangerous. That's what we're going to. Does the no near the hole also apply in this situation? Absolutely. No near the hole always applies in this situation. So that, that's why I gave the example of a ball that was just barely in the penalty area. If it's a large penalty area but near the hole, you don't get to run up there and drop it in the penalty area. You've got to proceed no near the hole. Good, good point there. All right. All right. Any other questions on the dangerous animal? All right. In a stroke play event, Taylor's ball is at rest with a great lie on the line of a red penalty area. So is her ball in the penalty area? Yes. A live snake is a few feet from her ball. What penalty free option may she take? Drop the ball in a general area in a relief area where the danger does not exist. Is that an option for her? No. Drop a ball in the general area in a relief area within two club lengths of where it lies on the red line. That's just crazy sounding, isn't it? It can't be right. Okay. We should stop when we're reading this. When we get to drop a ball in the general area, we know there's going to be no free relief at that point, right? Because the ball is in a penalty area. We've got to proceed under that. Drop a ball in a nearby similar penalty area and no near the hole where the danger does not exist? No. We cannot go to a similar penalty area anymore. So I wonder what the answer could be. Drop a ball in the same penalty area no near the hole where the danger does not exist. That's exactly the definition of it right there. So. This is the only free relief option for a ball in the penalty area. She may proceed or utilize any of the penalty relief options underneath the penalty area rule, but she may not drop a ball in a similar penalty area as that option has been removed. Okay. Good on that? All right. Embedded ball. Did you have a question, Bruce? A bunch of snakes, a bunch of dangerous animals. Yeah. These rules still apply. The rules still apply. So if we have, I mean, if we have a whole, if we got a whole bunch of dangerous animals in a certain situation, the rules still apply. We don't get to say, you know, well, just because there's no relief in a, in a penalty area, sorry. Sorry. All right. Embedded ball has changed a little bit. Um, so we'll talk about when relief is allowed and the ball must be embedded in the general area. It's important to note that it's the general area. Embedded ball is not available in a bunker or penalty area. Um, 
We're going to determine how a ball is embedded, whether or not it's embedded, and that hasn't changed. That's going to be the same as it has always been. Okay? Exceptions when relief is not allowed for a ball embedded in the general area. So when, when the ball is embedded in sand in a part of the general area that is not cut to fairway height or less. Okay? And also when interference by anything other than the ball being embedded makes the stroke completely unreasonable. So for example, a ball is plugged in the mud right there up against that tree. Even though the ball is embedded in the general area, this player is not entitled to relief because they can't make a stroke at this. It's reasonable to believe that. Okay. Same situation we talk about, relief for a cart path and so on and so forth. Okay. So determine whether a ball is embedded. These uh, examples are right there in your rules book. So another good example of something that we can just refer to. A player's ball is embedded only if it is in its own pitch mark. So it's got to be your own pitch mark. And the result of a player's previous stroke and part of the ball is below the level of the ground. Okay? So even though we've got grass in the second picture there in between the ball, it is still below the, ball, the, the level of the ground. That ball is embedded. It doesn't have to be touching dirt or sand or something crazy. It just has to break the surface of the ground. Okay? And it's also important to note that the ball does have to become airborne. Okay? Just driving the ball straight into the ground does not make it embedded, even though you've made a stroke on that. Okay? That is, that is a, a decision that was made, and it has also been incorporated into our new rules. So. If you blade, the, blade the ball right into uh, top. Yeah, if it doesn't get, if you, if you top it and the ball just goes straight down, which I've tried to do at top golf a number of times, but I just can't get it to embed, um, that it's not going to be an embedded ball. If you blade the ball, it, into, uh, if it goes straight into anything, if it does not get in the air, it is not embedded by this definition. Well, if it does get in the air, then it's embedded. It's, embedded. it's that simple. It's that simple. All right, so if a player cannot tell for sure whether the ball is embedded in its own pitch mark or another pitch mark, the player may treat the ball as embedded if it's reasonable to conclude from the available information that it's in its own pitch mark. So if there's a couple of pitch marks around, like a par three or something, just off the edge of the green, and it comes down and plugs and you're not sure if it jumped out into another pitch mark or whatever, the rules are saying, you're okay, it's in your own pitch mark, you're fine, take relief. Okay. A ball is not embedded if it is below the level of the ground as a result of anything other than the player's previous stroke, such as when the ball is pushed into the ground by someone stepping on it. Okay, it's a different rule, it's not embedded. Okay. The ball is driven straight into the ground without becoming airborne. Okay, so that again, like we were just talking about, that is not embedded. Or the ball was dropped in taking relief under a rule. And this is a change. There used to be a decision that said if you dropped it and it embedded, you got to take relief for an embedded ball again. Because we're dropping from knee height now, this is not going to happen. And if it does happen to indent the ground a little bit, it's not going to be enough for the rules to consider it to be embedded. So a dropped ball cannot be embedded. Okay. How we're going to take relief for the embedded ball has changed a little bit. So the reference point becomes the spot right behind the ball where the ball is embedded. So we got the direction of play obviously going that way. The spot right behind it is going to be our reference point. And the size of the relief area is going to be measured from that reference point one club length but with these limits. It must be in the general area and it must not be near the hold in the reference point. Okay, so again this is a general area relief rule so the ball and the, the reference point and the uh, relief area and the ball all have to be dropped into the general area and played from the general area. So there are possible times when an embedded ball may not be entitled to relief. For example, a ball embedded at the, embedded at the face of a bunker, and your reference point would be right back there in the sand. It's not in the general area. So unfortunately, you would not be entitled to free relief in that situation. Okay. So, so if our reference point happens to be in some temporary water, um, generally what I would do, and, and Doug and I have talked this about, if I'm there walking the player through it, I'm going to say, okay, we can skip this step. I know what you're going to do. The USGA would probably slap my wrist for saying that. They would probably want you to go through the entire procedure and do that. Um, because of, and the reasoning is a player can play the ball from temporary water. So let's see what happens. Um, you know, if the player skips a couple of things and gets the ball into a good position, I'm going to be okay with it if I find out about it later, as long as they use their best effort to put it in a good position. Um, 
generally, I'm, just to save a little bit of time, I like to just kind of skip over a step if I know it's going to happen. Um, but again, don't tell the USGA I said that. So, any other questions? Can you do that in most relief situations where it's recommended to follow the procedure? Yeah. But if you get the ball in the right spot. Yeah, if the, if the player is, is using their best judgment to get the ball in the right spot, they're covered. They are covered. Okay, it, it, they don't have to follow a procedure in a number of ways. Like when we're taking relief from a cart path, do we have to mark the ball? No. Do we have to measure out the club lengths? No. We don't have to follow the procedure in this situation. The following of the procedure of going through the rules, like I said, is really, you really should do it. Um, but I've been known to, like I said, skip a, a step, just like taking relief from a cart path over a casual water, we're going to go over here. So. But isn't it true, sometimes you want, it, you want that player to drop that ball so that you've got the next reference? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, like I said, it's, I keep saying don't tell the USGA I've done that, but uh, I'm not going to do it in every situation. I mean, it makes perfect sense to create a reference point for each situation. And I would really suggest that people do that. I'm not advocating that we skip steps. I'm just saying it's not going to cause an issue if a player does it, generally, because they're going to use their best judgment. Kind of sorry I even brought that up. All right. So lifting the ball to see if it lies in a condition where relief is allowed. This used to be a decision-based rule of when we could not clean a golf ball type of thing. So uh, now it is a rule of golf. So if a player reasonably believes that his or her ball lies in a condition where free relief is allowed underneath those rules, which is, I'm sure everybody has those memorized, 15.2, 16.1, 16.3, right? Good, don't even need to go over it. But can I decide that without lifting the ball? The player may lift the ball to see if relief is allowed. Do they have to have somebody come over and watch them? No, that is a change. You can do this on your own. So the spot of the ball first must be marked and lifted and the ball must not be cleaned unless we're doing this on the putting green, okay? There you go, there's your answers. Those situations of what rules that we're looking for free relief we're not sure about. So for example, if we're not sure our ball's embedded, we can mark it, lift it, check to see if it's embedded, and then replace it. But we don't clean it in that situation, okay? Okay, so if the player lifts the ball without having this reasonable belief, except on the putting green, he or she gets one penalty stroke. If relief is allowed and the player takes relief, there is no penalty even if the player didn't mark his ball or clean his ball. So kind of an eraser rule here type of thing. So if you just look, you see your ball is in some heavy grass, and you're like, you know what, I think that might be on a sprinkler head. You just pick it up without marking it and clean it, and you look down, oh, good, it wasn't a sprinkler head. No penalty. You get, you get to do the relief. Okay? Everybody get that one? I think I gave you guys a question on that one, too. Okay, but if relief is not allowed, if he picks that ball up and finds out there wasn't a sprinkler head there, and the player chooses not to take relief or that relief is not allowed, that player gets one penalty stroke if he or she did not mark the ball or cleaned it. So in that situation that I just said, you know, if there is no sprinkler head there, we get one penalty stroke for not marking your ball and cleaning it in that, in that situation. Okay, or if you decide not to take free relief, you get a penalty stroke. Don't know why you would ever do that, but that's an example there. Even if he, he thought there was a sprinkler head there? What do you mean? Well, you're saying in the previous example, you thought the player thought there was a sprinkler head. Okay. player thinks there's a sprinkler head there. So he picks up the ball and cleans it, no problem. Right. Is, yeah, if, if, he, uh, if he picks up the ball and cleans it without marking it and all this stuff, and it turns out he does get free relief, there's no penalty. So thinking about it, it's not a, no. It's got a, no. So if he does all this stuff here and then finds out there is no sprinkler head, he gets a one-stroke penalty, and he's got to replace the ball. So yeah. So basically, the premise of that rule is if the player's entitled to relief for free, we're not going to penalize it if he didn't go through the procedure correctly. So. All right. Is everybody good on that one? All right. In a stroke play event, Todd's ball is at rest in the general area and possibly in its own pitch mark. Without marking his ball, he lifts his ball, cleans it, and determines that it is in its own pitch mark. He drops the original ball in the correct relief area and makes a stroke. What's the ruling? Todd question? Yeah, no penalty. This is exactly what we were talking about. I got a, got a break there not knowing, or we got a break there that it was embedded. Had I done all that and it wasn't embedded, then I am on a hook for a penalty. Okay. Pretty clear on that one? Any questions for me? 15, 16? So during the ball search, you're in an area, as a general area, heavy grass. Okay. The player uh, finds the ball and he sees that it's embedded by the rules. 
Okay. And I guess somebody could have stepped on it during the ball search. Okay. Or it could have embedded it. Okay. So, so, so we're not sure why it's embedded. So the question is, uh, during a ball search, it's possible somebody has stepped on the, on the ball. Okay, so if, if we don't have any evidence to the contrary, the ball can be treated as embedded. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we're, gonna, we're not going to, you know, have to ask every player, you know, where were you walking, so that type of thing. Uh, but if somebody does say, hey, I stepped on that ball, then we're going to proceed underneath a ball moved by an outside influence and go through that procedure. Because it could have substantial impact on the shot. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Correct. Can, can we, so, so if I'm, I'm searching for my own ball and I step on it and embed it, okay, first of all, am I penalized there? No, no penalty for searching for it. Then I have to replace it, but I can't replace it in the exact spot where it is with the, with the being embedded. So can I fix that pitch mark? And I believe you cannot. I believe you cannot. Because you're going to have to replace it in a, in a similar lie but let me look into that one because that is a good question. I was you know, rereading the question in my head and seeing if we could fix that because that might improve the area of the intended stroke because we're going to replace that ball real close to where that is. So I'm not sure you get to fix that pitch mark. No, you're going to get it in a similar lie. That, remember, because now the, 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 the uh, area that we're to replace a ball has been altered, so we're going to go underneath that rule. It's the same thing as driving it over with a, with a golf cart. So we're not going to replace it back into that same lie. We're going to replace it in a similar nearby lie within one club length. But I don't think you get to fix the pitch mark. But good question. BJ. Uh, okay. So, so a ball lands in the rough and then goes, in, goes into the fairway but is in a pitch mark. Do we have reasonable belief that our ball is embedded in our own pitch mark? That's what we have to answer. So in this specific instance, probably not. Probably not. So any other questions? Yeah. So in the past, I've always been taught that people who have embedded balls have been the back in the hole. Right. The ball yep. Okay. Old rule. Right. Okay. So the, the let, let's go over that real quick. In this case. Uh huh. Right. So just so so what we need to do is we need to realize that this new procedure doesn't it has nothing to do with the old procedure. We used to have to drop an embedded ball and try to drop it in that old pitch mark, right? The exact same spot. Now we have a relief area that we have to get the ball into, and that relief area will not include that pitch mark. It cannot, because the reference point is behind the pitch mark, and then we have a one club length no near the hole in that reference point. So that pitch mark is not even going to be a consideration anymore. So if that ball rolls into that pitch mark, what are we going to do? We're going to redrop it because it's out of the relief area. It's no longer, the ball is not in the relief area. Exactly. Exactly. Can you fix that pitch Yes. The, the embedded ball? The pitch mark? Yes, it is. Because the, the embedded ball is here, and now we have a reference point behind it. So now your ball is closer to the hole. But that doesn't matter anymore because we have a reference point we're dealing with. Because now we have to, because we're trying to drop a ball into a penalty, or excuse me, a relief area that uses a reference point. So the original lie of the ball no longer has any concern to us. Because if it, yeah, if it goes, it's going to be drop, drop, place. Exactly. But that, that pitch mark has no reference to us anymore once we create a reference point. Okay. Yep. And there's a question about that. Can you fix that pitch mark? I've got that question that we're going to talk about. All right, everybody got uh, ready for the quiz review here real quick? All right, so true or false, a player may break off a piece of a large, loose impediment so, they may, so she may make a stroke. That is true. A player may break off a piece of a large, loose impediment or get assistance in moving or breaking it off. A loose impediment, again, is not defined by size. So it's okay to break off a loose impediment, no problem. A ball is not found in a movable obstruction. The player must proceed under stroke and distance. False. Yep. 
If we have virtual certainty that the ball is in the movable obstruction, we've got a procedure that we can uh, go underneath as well. If a ball is in play on the fringe helping any player, it may be lifted as long as it is not cleaned. True or false? True or false? <laughs> Nobody wants to answer. False. Why is it false? A ball is on the fringe cannot be helping somebody. A ball has to be on the putting green to be helping. Okay. A ball does not interfere with play if it is close enough to be a distraction to the player. False. We know that, that if we have a distraction for a golf ball there, we're entitled for that ball to be moved. Okay. In stroke play, Todd and Doug are partners. What, your question? Yeah, good question. On 1A. Mm-hmm. No, they're entitled to remove any part of a loose impediment. You're entitled to move a loose impediment, so the rules make it say you can move any part of the loose impediment. So there's no, I mean, you're not improving anything by removing a loose impediment. You're not violating any rule at all. But I thought there was a question that we had just a while back. If it was a while back and it was before 2019, I don't care anymore. <laughs> with, uh, probably with breaking off. It was Jackie, and she broke off a limb or something. That was growing and fixed. Yeah, that was growing and fixed, right? I don't recall. Yeah, if it was growing and fixed, so that's not a loose impediment. Okay. So that, that's a different rule. Okay, I did not recall whether it was growing yeah. and fixed. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember the question now. Where in her backswing, we broke it off, and then she tried to fix it by putting it back, which is a new rule. But because that's not a loose impediment, that's a different rule. And a loose impediment, you're entitled to remove it any way you want, so you're also entitled to move any part of it in any way you want. All right, so in stroke play, Todd and Doug are partners. Todd's ball is at rest a few inches from the hole, and Doug is getting ready to play a bunker shot when he asks Todd to leave his ball there just in case I blade it. Todd agrees and does. Doug then hits his bunker shot onto the green 30 feet from the hole. What's the ruling? We got this penalty situation? That's right. Both players have penalized two strokes. The players agree to leave a ball in place to help, but therefore each player gets the general penalty. The fact it did not help is irrelevant. Just because Doug's not a very good bunker player, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Not waiving a rule. Waiving a rule. It's just, uh, that's, that's violating a rule. If we, yeah, probably in this situation, no, we don't know the rule. You know, I'm learning as much as you are every time I give this seminar, so. That's a good point, though. I like that. All right, so in stroke play, Bailey is dropping a ball for relief of an embedded ball in the general area 150 yards from the green. She fixes her pitch mark and then drops her ball correctly. What is the correct ruling? There's no penalty. Why is there no penalty? The, re yeah, the repair of the pitch mark is allowed. Is it's not in the relief area, so it's not where we're going to drop the ball, right? It's outside of it. It didn't help her play. So her pitch mark is not in that relief area, and it will not help her next stroke from 150 yards. This is basically a care of the course. Okay? So you can repair that pitch mark. Not to be argumentative. You can be argumentative. Robin, our good friend Robin. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Examples of actions unlikely to create a potential advantage. Uh -huh. That's fixing a pitch mark that is several yards away on a 150 yard shot. Okay. In this case, that pitch mark could be within inches of your stroke. It could be. So, in that case, can you or can you, are you not allowed to fix that? She would be allowed to fix it before she dropped, and if she dropped and it came to a point where fixing that pitch mark would improve the area affecting the stroke, then she would be penalized. Does that make sense? Repeat that one more time. So she can fix the pitch mark because it's not in her relief area, and it's not going to affect her stroke from 150 yards. But if she does drop it and it comes to a spot that's like this far from the original pitch mark, and then she fixes it, it may be a penalty because it may affect the conditions affecting her stroke. That's where it could become a penalty because now she's improving that area. But before she drops it, she can repair it, no problem. Yeah. But, and then even if she drops it in the relief area off to the side and it, that pitch mark is not going to affect her, now she can even repair it then as well. Okay. But there, there's a rare, you're, you're bringing up a, a point that it might affect her. And then if it is going to improve those conditions, that would be a penalty. Yeah. That's a good point. Okay. Yes. Where he stepped on the ball and it while searching for it, he would put it in the nearest one somewhere alive, and he could repair the pitch mark, assuming it doesn't improve the conditions affecting the stroke. 
Right, I would think so as well, but that's why I would have to look that up and, and determine if it did uh, 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 improve those conditions, which it probably wouldn't, but you never know. But you're right, that's the exact way to answer that question 100%. So it's a black or white answer that we have to determine what is the black and white. And so that's, that's really an interesting part of the rules of golf. So. All right, in stroke play, Doug's ball is in a depression in the fairway after he topped a tee shot that rolled 75 yards to its current position. Thinking it may be embedded, he marks it and lifts the ball and sees it is not embedded and he correctly replaces the ball and makes a stroke. What is the correct ruling? Does Doug have reason to believe his ball is embedded after topping a ball that rolled 75 yards? No, he's going to get a one-stroke penalty. Doug does not have that reasonable evidence to think that his ball is embedded. Well, I mean, even if it got airborne and bounced a little bit, it's not going to plug in its own pitch mark 75 yards later. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not just the airborne part of it. So, yeah, we have to have reasonable belief that his ball meets all those conditions. In individual stroke plays, Todd's ball is on the fringe with Bailey's ball also on the fringe, one foot near the hole on his line of play. Without anything being said, Bailey marks and lifts her ball and sets it aside so as not to clean it. Todd makes a stroke and Bailey correctly replaces her ball. Which of the following is correct? Do we have a penalty in that situation? We do, B. Bailey is penalized one stroke. Even though Bailey's ball may interfere with Todd's play, she may only lift it upon my request. A player does not have the right to determine their ball is interfering with somebody. It's the person who's going to make the stroke. Six, true or false? If a ball is embedded in the rough and unplayable under a bush, no relief is allowed? True. And I specifically said unplayable under a bush. I mean, we got to make sure that the, that stroke is not available at all so that the player cannot get relief. If he does have a chance to make a stroke at it and it's under a bush, he could be entitled to relief. Could be entitled to relief. I'm not saying automatically, but we have to determine whether or not it's unreasonable for him to make that stroke. Okay. Taking relief for an embedded ball is substituted for a new ball just because it was scuffed. Is that okay? Okay, there's no penalty in that situation, okay? Because any time you're taking relief, it doesn't matter why you're substituting it, you get to. A ball must touch the soil below the surface of the ground to be considered embedded. True or false? False. Correct. A ball, if you look at the diagram, a ball only needs to break the surface of the ground to be embedded. True or false, in taking relief from a sprinkler head in the general area, if the relief area includes a part of the putting green, a ball may be placed there. True or false? False. The relief area must also be in the general area. True or false, if complete relief is available from an abnormal ground condition in a bunker, a player may not use the one stroke back on the line option to drop the ball out of the bunker. That is false. The player always has that option. Even if the, if the, if the think of it this way, if you have a very large bunker, and a tiny little puddle of water right there in the middle of it, and your ball's in that tiny little puddle, you can still take it back out of the bunker for one penalty stroke. You're allowed to do that. Just because relief is available for free, the rules are saying, well, if you want one stroke, go ahead, take it out. A player may take free relief from poison ivy, true or false? False. Poison ivy is not a dangerous animal condition. Okay. I, a lot of people will argue with this thing, but it does not fall underneath the rules. I mean, it's the same thing as a thorn bush. So you just, uh, bad break, sorry. So, all right, that does it for 15 and 16. Next week we will talk about penalty relief area, or penalty areas and penalty relief options, stroke and distance, unplayable ball, the penalty areas. Uh, if you guys have any questions, come on up and see me, and uh, we'll go from there.